Technology is great, but it should be used to enhance our humanity, not minimize it. Data is good, but not when it's used to track and control us. Our children should be in classrooms with other children and with a real teacher in front of them. They deserve their humanity to be recognized and to be cultivated in an authentic way, not through virtual reality or through an algorithm, but in the real world. And that's the world I want to live in too, as a teacher, doing what I love. Hello, hello, all those beautiful faces. How we doing? How we doing? Stephanie checking in with some more of that class disruption. And today, ooh, do we have some of that for you from Richard Carranza, the former chancellor of New York City's new gig at an ed tech firm and how they do millions of dollars in contract with his former employer, my current employer, NYC Schools and how that's related to why we need to open these schools now. But before we get into it, you know what I need you to do, all that good YouTube stuff. So hit that like button. If you're new here, I love that beautiful face. Hit that subscribe button so you can see more of this beautiful face and drop a comment down below. Let us know where you're checking in from, where you stand on these issues, and definitely share this video because there are a lot of malevolent forces at work out there and it's only through the courage to stand up to their status quo, to their grip on power, will we, the people, be able to take our schools back for us. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let's get into it. Richard Carranza has a new job. You might know him as the former chancellor of the New York City schools or the former superintendent of the Houston, Texas public schools, or before that, the superintendent of the San Francisco public schools. But he's finally done running public school systems all over the country into the ground. And now he's here to offer them a solution for their failed systems online learning. So you can see here, Chalkbeat article, Carranza joins Silicon Valley ed tech firm. Weeks after his departure as NYC schools chancellor, he takes a private sector job at IXL. And when they say just weeks, they mean just weeks. This was only three weeks after he resigned on February 26th. And the reason or one of the main reasons he cited for leaving was that he needed time to mourn. He lost 11 people that were close to him in the pandemic. And he said that he just needed some time. Or he had this planned and uh, was ready to go. But uh, hey, who am I to be making any such conclusions? And so this isn't just any ed tech firm. This is one of the biggest and it's one of the ones that has major contracts with New York City schools. In fact, in the last two years, this company has had $3.3 million in contracts with the NYC DOE. Conflict of interest? You tell me. And according to the CEO of the company, Paul Mishkin, Richard will supply IXL with an abundance of wisdom gained from working at the highest levels of K-12 education and a boundless commitment to ensuring all students have access to a world-class learning experience. Well, I can say there was much to be desired in that world-class experience in New York City, and I think some might say the same in Houston and San Francisco. But hey. I don't own a multi-million dollar ed tech company, do I? Interestingly, in Carranza's last press conference, he said this. The new normal, that phrase, the new normal. The new normal that we're talking about. It's like, who's new normal? Not my new normal. The new normal that we're talking about post-pandemic has really created some opportunities for us to individualize instruction and really tailor instruction for in students in a way that we just didn't have the ability to do before the pandemic. So like I said, that was something he said at one of his last press conferences. But uh, 
don't mind all the kids who've learned nothing over the past year and a half. Yeah, you know, no big deal, right? I mean, ed tech will come to the rescue. But I'm just gonna, I'm gonna let that one sit there. We'll come back around to that quote at the end once I make that connection to what his departure has to do with why we need to fully open schools now. Because when I first found out about his departure to this ed tech company, I was boiling mad. But with some space between me and the announcement, I've been able to see the bigger picture and make a connection to another argument that I've been making in terms of why we need to open schools. And it's not just for the kids, but it's also for the profession of teaching and preserving our place in society and education and in the community. And this is a point actually that Michael Caine, leader of New York Teachers for Choice, a caucus in the United Federation of Teachers here in New York City, who I've gotten to know over the past several months as I've embarked on this open schools um, advocacy and just my own advocacy for my own medical privacy, because that's what New York Teachers for Choice Caucus is about, is uh, advocating for medical privacy. And of course, with COVID, we have a big intrusion of medical privacy. Um, but he's also making this connection and he put up this article right here on his blog that when it comes to reopening school teachers must be selfish and he makes this connection and he frames it very well and what he says is the longer teachers work remotely the longer we play into the ed tech agenda which does not include a robust middle class profession of teachers Former NYC schools Chancellor Richard Carranza played a major role in keeping NYC schools shuttered and working remotely. He resigned and is now working at a major ed tech company who made millions off the COVID crisis and the NYC schools that Carranza shuttered. If teachers can't read the tea leaves here, we have a real problem. And we, ha we have a real problem regardless, but it would definitely help us address the problem if people would read those tea leaves. And so right about here is where I fell down the rabbit hole. See, just like you up until right now when I'm about to tell you, you probably thought that reimagining education came about during the pandemic as a way to address the emergency situation that we were facing with COVID-19. Well, it turns out that this whole idea of reimagining education has been in the works for several years, and it's included all the big players, including our very own union heads. And so I start going through his article in a little bit more detail and clicking on some of the links. And so I click on this link, and then I come to this article, look whose faces I see. And I'm reading through and I come to this video. And so what I want to do with the rest of this video here is go through, play some clips from that, summarize her main points and some of the predictions she was making back in 2017 when she made this video and show you how, at least so far, all of her, her predictions have become, have begun to come to fruition in a very scary and dystopian way. Like it's almost, it's like to the T what she is saying three years ago is unfolding before our eyes. So let's go ahead and get into this video. We're gonna start it around four minutes and 26 seconds. Of course, I'll link the whole thing in the description down below. I highly suggest you go and watch it. I'm really only gonna recap the first 45 minutes. Uh, the second half of it, she kind of goes into much more detail about all of these main points that she makes at the beginning. So I'm gonna cover the big picture here, but definitely, Go and check out the full thing. Go do research on these companies that she's talking about because it gets crazy. So she's going to start out with 
um, this graphic that's put together by a company called Global Education Futures. And this is their vision of what education is going to look like. It says in 2037 on their graphic, but you know, in the future. And there's a few other big companies that she'll reference. And we're looking at what they think the future of education will look like. So let's go ahead and get Allison on the screen. But they have a very different version. This is a version that connects with sort of the quantified self, like you as your data that you generate and reputation management and education as sort of lifelong career-based skill building. Now, if you look at that, there really isn't school. Um, there's not really teachers. You have mentors. Um, there's lots of devices and big data and sort of gathering data and in terms of leveraging them for sort of future opportunities. So this is just a planning document. Of course, we don't know for sure this is how it's going to play out, but this is the vision of these big ed tech companies and other entities that are involved. They, this is what they are aiming for and doing so openly. Uh, so we definitely need to start to recognize some of these things that are going on and push back against them because these companies are spending millions of dollars investing in research and development and, and we're just regular people trying to live our life, trying to do better for our families, trying to, uh, you know, live that American dream and, and get there's all these big power players going on here. So it's up to us, the people, to, to push back against this. Otherwise, one day, you know, it, it's going to happen real quick. You'll just wake up and there will be no school to go to. I mean, it's basically how it is in, in 2021. And a lot of the things that they say, these companies say when they talk about their plans, they sound good. Right? It sounds like things that we should all want. They sound progressive and like they're going to create more equity. Um, but what we have to realize is who's in control of that? Where does that information go when they've got us hooked up to their platforms? They're tracking us, monetizing us, and controlling our learning outcomes via their algorithms, which are more or less going to replace teachers. And so in this next clip, Allison is going to speak to exactly these forces and what she foresees as the end game in all of this. Oftentimes it will sound great. Well, it might sound very progressive. It might sound like a great foil for the terror of high stakes testing that we've lived in, a, a great al alternative that we care about children and, and, and the future of humanity. Um, but if they accomplish what I'm going to talk about, like this is where things are headed. There will be eliminating local control of education, so putting education largely onto digital platforms that are controlled by corporations, um, automating teaching. Um, right before Christmas, the White House issued a white paper about the future of um, the labor market and AI, artificial intelligence, and what the implications are. So there are like grave concerns within sort of the government and the global corporate sector about what um, automation of many service level jobs could look like in the next 20 years for our kids and grandkids. So, so that is move, that's a force moving forward. Um, creating a system, what I call it's really educational surveillance. So once education becomes a predominantly something that happens through a digital platform, that is something that can be monitored and data polled. Um, Big brother, he's always watching. ESSA has been very big on like whole child. We're talking about a lot about whole child education and really caring about all aspects of children, which is sounds really good, and I, I agree with that in many respects. But building like large data sets and adding that onto the academics is is troubling to me. And the idea of profiling children from a very early age and using those profiles to sort of reinforce um, certain pathways and tracks is probably right. And so you see, they they make it sound so good, but on the back end, it's so duplicitous in what they are doing. They don't care about the whole child learning. They care about what happens on that back end. Problematic. Um, the learning eso ecosystem concept that they're talking about essentially is, is the idea of that you don't necessarily have neighborhood schools, that there are these drop-in centers, that a lot of learning takes place in other spaces, and that you check in with someone on your, you know, your data dashboard occasionally. And so a lot of this does seem like it's a bit of, of a ways off. 
even after a year or so of this online virtual learning, because a lot of our reform battles are still focused on things like charter schools or vouchers or high stakes tests or the composition of school boards, right? These are things that the big ed tech corporations and these other groups are almost putting themselves in perfect position to solve these problems. It's like they created these problems almost to purposely solve them in this way. Um, and, and again, these things sound good, right? Individualized learning, whole child approaches, project-based, um, whole standards, uh, rather than letter grades and GPAs, getting more tech into the classroom, having flexible scheduling and real world skills, etc. right? These things sound good. And so I'm going to go to this next clip where Allison addresses this point in a little bit more detail. She's already started to get at. So what I'm saying is right now we're dealing with education reform 1.0 um, on the left. These are all things that we're very familiar with. Vouchers, charters, Teach for America, closures and turnarounds, end of year testing, austerity budgeting, um, non-elected school boards. So these are things, and they're very difficult. And for, for teachers who are maxed out, have all these expectations, there's very little bandwidth to do much more than fight this, right? Like this is in our face all the time. This is the immediate danger. But meanwhile, while this is all happening, this is where they're going next, which is what I call Ed Reform 2.0, and these are all trends in um, education. So I, largest among them is the learning ecosystem. Hybrid blended learning will be this transition to having more and more digital in the classroom, less and less time with human teachers. Um, there's lots of development in online gaming. All right, we see these things happening right now, especially in the pandemic. I'm teaching hybrid right now, and definitely a big dilemma. Um, in pulling data out of gamification of education. Uh, there's a big growth industry in AR and VR simulations, even in, down in K-12, the Google Cardboard. Um, again, collecting data on the whole child, the social emotional learning, uh, earning credit outside of school buildings. So this new dialogue is about eliminating seat time. We don't want the old factory model of education. We're going to eliminate seat time. We right, and, and again, it sounds good. We always complain about how it's just like seat time for seat time. And we see now with this whole shift to online learning, virtual learning in the pandemic, where we're being much more flexible with our lessons. We record our lessons and kids can watch them later and do the work when it fits their schedule. And so it's like in many ways, these seem like some they could be good shifts. But again, what's going on behind the curtain? What's happening here in the bigger picture? Where is this all going? And so... I want to go on to this next part here where she's going to put on another graphic about how about this decentralized nature of learning. They're saying that school will, will take many forms and sometimes it will be self-organized. Okay. Um, that learners will have uh, learning playlists. So the folks behind this, these are the Netflix folks. These are education as a playlist. Um, re reflecting your desires. Um, and the playlist might, might include public schools, but could also include a wide variety of digitally mediated or place-based learning experiences. Here's where we can see another big shift in education that's happening right now with the seat time. Right? We, we're trying to be flexible, understanding of kids, different situations. We record our lessons, put them up. They can do them when it works for them. Obviously, preferably we want them live, but it's set up to be flexible in that way. And we weren't much talking about these things in 2017 when Allison recorded this speech or gave this talk, but you can see how the pandemic has just ushered these in to create this space where these are rather common conversations. And one of the other things, though, that we see happening from these shifts is how inequitable online learning is from the tech itself, right? Having a good device, having a good internet connection to being able to navigate the many online platforms and the portals and the nonstop emails. It's a lot 
to navigate. So here's another graphic that we're going to look at that really looks at this decentralization of education and the nature of it and how that's going to impact us potentially as students and as families. Now, earlier I had said that teachers are going to be replaced by algorithms and in many ways that's going to happen. Although there will still be some actual humans involved in the process, it's going to look much different than it looked before. Works document, this is how they see the role of educators in the new workforce. So this is, this is what, what they think teachers will be doing. Um, data stewards, learning pathway designers, uh, pop-up reality producers, micro-credential analysts. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too traditional. Like, am, I, am I a Luddite who doesn't want progress? I mean, maybe. But I would say, like I have been saying, I'm on board with the vision. Just not the execution. Not that back end where it's all leading to and who it's controlled by. Remember, these are the biggest corporations that are driving this, right? I want all these things, but I want them to be done locally for the community, by the community, and in more than just name of community schools, which is how these companies seem to be using a lot of their language, just in name. There's nothing authentic about it. And she's going to reinforce this point right here. So the people who are driving this vision are the, are the corporations and high level like foundations and philanthropic interests and the nonprofits who are going to be in the ecosystem, not schools. Teachers don't know this is happening. I mean, teachers don't, I mean, raise your hand. Have you guys like heard of learning ecosystem? I mean, they're... I mean, in 2017, no, definitely not. In 2021, as this is unfolding before our eyes, it's time to start reading the tea leaves. It's time for us to start waking up. Because in 2017, I would have never thought that kids wouldn't be learning in schools and they'd be in their house learning over computers. But here we are, and many are embracing this new normal. But this next clip, I get, I get shivers on my spine every time I hear it. It's, it's a freaky one. You know, are, are we looking at a time when we might not have schools and human teachers? Mostly like maybe token teachers. And it's kind of hard to imagine. My husband said they would never get rid of school. Come on. <laughs> Welcome to 2020, 2021. Year of the token teacher. I mean, that's really, that's really what it feels like. It feels like we're putting some act so they can point to us and say, oh, look, there's teachers teaching and students learning, but there's not much real teaching or learning going on. I mean, at least beyond the surface and uh and listen to the story she goes on to tell and they would never get rid of school well um the state of pennsylvania has been in a budget crisis with education for years and like within the past year um, erie pennsylvania has seriously entertained the idea of not having high school due to financial reasons we may not have high school kids can go online or we'll bus them to a nearby district and, and so what I say is it won't happen until it happens. And then I don't think we're going to get a lot of lead time once the infrastructure is in place for this fallback. Um, you know, I and my friends, the infrastructure is now in place for this fallback. It is here. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem like enough people are reading those tea leaves. In fact, when I tweeted out the article, Michael's article, and I had taken out that quote about how if we, the longer we work remotely, we're playing into EdTech's agenda. And this parent, I thought it was a teacher at first, but it's a parent, uh, asks, how is that? When teachers are teaching via Zoom, our Zoom doesn't have a built-in teacher. And so I replied, self-paced courses mean teachers aren't needed to plan or do much teaching. They already do it in New York City for a lot of the credit recovery, and we did it for summer school last year. My only job was to call the kids and tell them to log on and give, uh, I should say, a bit of guidance here or there. And boy, was I more spot on than I could have ever imagined. And yeah, a lot of these courses right now, they're, they're pretty boring. 
but there are big improvements in the pipelines and especially after this year the amount of data and money that has been poured into these companies they are going to be upping their game and in fact the well-funded ones you can already see the improvements they're doing more gamified stuff they're doing more things to adjust to your level and your interests and in fact, the Army Research Lab has been doing a lot of work in this area of how to make uh, online courses more engaging, more adaptive, um, and tracking all sorts of data. And again, it might not seem like a big deal, right? You, well, I don't have anything to hide, right? If they, they want it, they can have it. But what we what these algorithms do to us on social media platforms, I mean, see how they divide us, how they how they censor certain things, how they control your thinking almost in a way. Imagine that injected into our learning platforms. You know, as teachers, we, I always strive and we're supposed to strive to, to be not biased, right? To present both sides of an argument and uh, let the students, you know, explore the different sides and decide for themselves, come to their own conclusion. But the way that I see big tech manipulating these platforms, I can only begin to wonder how they're going to manipulate the learning experiences and what information they do and don't show our students. What agenda are they going to be driving? And Allison, as she has been all throughout this video, breaks it down again in very stark terms. So now they're they're building into these systems emotion sensing software to monitor your engagement with the platform and remediate you. So this is the table of contents. Um, chapter one is a little blurry, but it's, it's thoughts on instructional management of affect, engagement, and grit. So they're building grit monitoring into these platforms. Um, chapter seven is adaptive interventions to address students' negative activating and deactivating emotions during learning. So like this is pretty, so, so this is a little overwhelming. Um, chapter six is about personalized content. And just so you know that this, this is specifically linked to school, like K-12 schooling, um, Carnegie Learning, which was an outgrowth of Carnegie Mellon University, um, they have, have developed a math IA um, program that's supposedly in a bestseller. And I just had to testify against an expansion of this contract in the Philadelphia School District. So it was a middle school math program. So, you know, that's something I don't think people appreciate, um, that these online systems, this was done by USC um, for the Army Research Lab, and this is, and they're, they're not only teaching math, but managing kids' emotions while they're doing the math programs. So this is kind of where things are headed, and again, it's a little Brave New World-ish, but um, this, in, in, the, in the upper corner, this is um, Alex, and it's out of CMU. They're, they're prototyping this around southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, they say children learn better with peers, and peer-based learning is great. So we're going to have big screens, like supersized screens, and kids can interact in front of these cartoon peers to learn. And, and there was like a culturally relevant component to that, too, somehow. So this is like their version, their, their prototype. Of course, you know, drop in culturally relevant and... Uh yeah, it makes it awesome. Woohoo! Taping it. There's a big issue with uh, Reasoning Mind um, in Texas. They have these like genie chatbot interfaces with really young kids. It was a program that was developed in Russia. Like, and parents, kids were getting attached to their chatbot instructors. And it's interesting, like, even a year ago, I had a friend who, who teaches in Philadelphia, and the kids are all being put on these systems, particularly in turnaround schools where they need to up the test scores. And he, he said, yeah, these kids are interacting with these online tutors. Some of them are real people. Some of them are just like narrow AI formats. But he's like, that's my job. Like they're already outsourcing like my job to online systems. So you can see from the students to the teachers, they want to take control of every aspect of the learning experience and and as she pointed out the people who are funding these programs who are making these decisions for our children these are not the people that we want to be making decisions right and it and it really just gets more creepy and more big brother-esque 
and you're going to see one of the taglines that they use is anytime, anywhere, any path, any pace. And remember, this is back in 2017, but now with virtual learning, this is the status quo in many places. Like we, we were talking about seat time before and and these are commonplace conversations between educators. I was just talking about this with one of my colleagues and she was saying, you know, it's, it's great, the new flexibility that our students have. You know, they have so many varied situations, whether it's their own personal things or something going on with their family. And it, it allows them to access the material when is best for them. And I agree with her in so many ways, but... We have to really be aware of the forces at play. We have to be aware at who's controlling these mechanisms and the direction that this is all heading in because they don't just want the kids from K to 12. They want the kids from birth all the way up until they're old. They want this to be a lifelong deal and you're going to see really how they're setting this up in a way that's almost like a social credit system. So they want you from like preschool up through your human capital days, like cradle to gray is sort of what Strive is after, cradle to gray. Um, building your skill sets and storing all of who you are in that learning record store, the LRS. So LMSs are learning management systems. So that's like Dreambox, Compass Learning, like corporate like learning modules. But, and that's where it's been for quite some time. But now with the internet of things and more sense, sensor based, they want to be able, and mobile devices, to pull all of that in. So, you know, they want you to be able to pull in your education from YouTube, um, to like download mentor relationships, to download, you know, for profit and non profit information into these systems. And IMS Global, you should look them up. I mean, it's the number of partners that they have. And again, it's not just K 12, it's universities, community colleges, everything. They're in charge of making everything interoperable. So that as long as you're bought into the system and the data tagging system, you can be plugged into the anytime, anywhere learning you so you don't need schools. So you can see what I mean, how, yeah, it seems cool. Oh, I can, I watch YouTube videos already or I go to this museum already so I can get credit for that. But it's not, it gets centralized, that data, into one system and that's where it becomes very dangerous and now I think that this whole idea between centralization and decentralization is an interesting one and it's an important power dynamic to understand how institutions work and all that for example in New York City I'm I have made the argument that we need to decentralize our system the central DOE has too much power too much control and it's just so slow in being able to meet the needs of the million students who are in New York City public schools and I think that each individual school should be able to have more power to determine what they look like of course at the same time I'm not saying there is no role for central it's just about finding that right balance and I would argue we need to shift it more back to the individual school level or at least to the district level um but this is a different relationship between centralization and decentralization because they're almost using the decentralization to cover for that centralization aspect that happens after. And that's why it, it can be hard to read the tea leaves because you're looking at all these cool things like, oh, I can, you know, YouTube, I can do museums, I can get credit for that. It's flexible. But what you're not seeing is that centralization piece that lies behind it. And that's the dangerous piece. And so... Then she goes into about how this transition happens. And again, this is where it really starts to get real because we're in that. We're in this weird hybrid phase. And that's what she's arguing is the intermediary phase before we get to that end game. So here we're going to give her a second to talk about that. I see hybrid blended learning as this intermediary phase, and we're really on the threshold of moving into this, some places more than others, like the one-to-one -one device initiatives, um, the idea of creating digital learning spaces within neighborhood schools and making that normal. So a lot of that's going to be driven by finance, by teacher shortages, by other things, but spending money on devices, not spending money on people. Uh, this was... A well, those are some quite prophetic words right there. Let's see where this is going, making blended learning work. And remember, this is 2017 here. 
a report that was done last year. It's an industry publication. It was promoting best practices. Our chief academic officer was involved. There were like 20 other high level district representatives from all over the country saying like, these are best practices for hybrid learning. And what I'm trying to say in terms of the context of the charter fight, and what's really interesting, hybrid learning is going to be charterizing our schools from within. And I wrote a blog post. Um, I, I, I work in a garden. And um, in the high summer, we have um, what's called cicada killers. I don't know if any of you have heard of cicada killers. But they're, they're one of the largest wasps. And they catch cicadas, and they, they paralyze them and drag them underground into a burrow, and they incubate their eggs on the, on the and the, the cicadas aren't dead yet. But you know, like it's, that's, and I really think that the hybrid learning is the charterizing our schools from within. Like we're, we're inviting this in. They've got us, we're sort of zombified because people's resources are stretched and unable to function in many ways. And then ultimately, the digital learning, we will have brought it into our schools and, and it will be the end game. So, um, well, that was um, depressing to say the least. I'm sitting here and I'm just thinking about how the pandemic literally did this to us. Like. We were the cicada that got dragged under, right? We were burrowed into our homes, alive but paralyzed, and the system has just fed off us for this last year. And now we're do willing to do whatever it takes to, you know, we'll accept whatever to get society going again, even if it means this new normal. And I don't want to get all, you know, conspiracy on you, but this plan, you know, because we're talking years before the pandemic, and I can't help but to think how these plans seem to align with many other discussions that are going on in these elite circles, uh, perhaps most widely known or popularly known as the Great Reset by the World Economic Forum. Uh, they have been wanting an excuse, it seems, for a while to bring in this new order to our society, this digitized, this virtual, all controlled, you know, data collection. And so I'm not denying the realness of the virus in any way, but what I am doing is I'm A, I'm questioning the origin of it, and B, I question the response to it. And was it really necessary for us to shut everything down or was it simply a power grab to disrupt the order and build back better and so in this next part we get into that whole reimagine education right because that wasn't started with the pandemic that was started many years before the pandemic and all the big players have been in on this conversation for a while now so Allison's going to break that down right here. Called Education Reimagined, uh, which was a collaboration across many different interest areas um, from the digital learning proponents, including the national leadership of both the um, American Federation of Teachers and the National Education Association, um, collaborating on this new vision of education reimagined, personalized education. Um, and uh, Becky uh, Pringle, from, who's the vice president of the NEA, attended the closing keynote of the INACAL National Conference. INACAL is the International Association of K-12 Online Learning which has been pushing most of this, and um, was Giselle Huff, who got the Lifetime Achievement Award from Ina Call, and they were best buddies, and they shared this keynote together and said how great it was to collaborate together on this new version of education. Um, so, so, well, this puts a whole new light on the union's play here in the whole open schools versus closed school debate. Right, They have been in this game of pushing for online learning for a while now. So it's not just a whole worker safety thing. It seems to be an agenda thing. And it's beyond trying to get the money from uh, the federal government in their bills. This, this goes to a whole new way that these people are envisioning our education system is going to be. And so I'm not really sure how this plays into their whole long-term existence as a union because, as we've said, and I'm going to show you in a second, that this will inevitably lead to the decreasing um, 
to the decrease in teachers, right? Into these good middle class uh, jobs with good benefits and security. And I mean, but I wouldn't put a past them to be as sinister as Carranza or also Joe Klein, who was a past uh, su- um, chancellor of New York City schools who went into one of these big ed tech companies. Maybe that's what they see happening, right? They bring about this system and then they'll transition right into be the head of one of these companies or into some role in the federal government because, of course, there's this whole, you know, fascistic relationship going on there. So I'm not exactly sure how that plays out, but it's really starting to show that there's a lot more to this than just worker rights. There's an agenda here. And, and again, this isn't something that we have to guess at that's going to happen to teaching jobs. The companies are saying it themselves. This is from, from the report. This Cabarrus County is in North Carolina. And this is the end game. They said, you know, starting in 2014, the district Cabarrus County identified its best high school and middle school teachers. They doubled the amount of students those educators teach. They cut the in-person time in half and paid the teachers more to reach more kids and get the same results, which is test results, really. And, and so what are the kids doing on the other half of time when they're not with their teacher, right? Well, they're, they're on online platforms. Mm-hmm. So they're in the online platforms. Like they're in, it's, it's, they call it a rotation model uh, oftentimes, so it'll be like, they're a third of the time they're by themselves with the computer and a third of the time they're with peers with the device and then a third of the time they're having really high quality time with a small group of students with the teacher but like so the teacher maybe has 10 kids and your your child gets 15 minutes of face time with the teacher during that cycle um right and this isn't something that we have to imagine this is literally what we are doing right now this is a typical schedule for a lot of kids And so what do we need to do? We need to follow the money. So this is how they do it. Um, The learning accelerator was specifically set up to push blended learning. And so what they said is we're going to do all the stuff that doesn't make sense for 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 for-profit people to do. So we're going to do all the, create all of the infrastructure to allow this to happen. And so they're being funded by like Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which is Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the Hume Foundation with Giselle Hoff that I had mentioned, um, Gates, Carnegie, Hewlett Packard is really big in all of this. So they're throwing their money into the learning accelerator. Um, Their folks are all connected also with alt certification programs for teachers because they don't really want veteran teachers doing this because they're not going to like it and they're going to be unhappy. They want to bring people up who are like feel the data driven playlist education is the bee's knees. So they're working with the Broad Academy and the new teacher project and all of these sort of, you know, they're all connected staff wise. So they're feeding this whole system. So they're, they're paying for the broadband access and the E-rate programs. And again, it's framed as digital divide, right? And it's kind of hard to be against digital access, except if you don't appreciate this model of education. But they're paying for the access. They're paying for research, the Friday Institute and NC State, so they pay off higher education to create reports that say this is good. Um, They pay for the open education resources programs. They pay for the platforms that put the open education resources together into systems. Um, They're paying for professional development to try to train the teachers that aren't the brand new teachers into making sure that they do it. And, and, And also the platforms themselves, also Power My Learning and Computers for Youth are computers in homes. And again, it's that digital, are we against having low income people have computer access in their home? No, but if the idea is that once they all have a Chromebook, we don't need a school, yes, I have a problem with that. And that's not being spoken of in a broad way. And and that's exactly where I stand on this issue as well. I, I like these initiatives. I want kids and families to have computers and access to the internet, to access the world wide web of information and connect with people and get all sorts of different experiences that you can't get without the internet. You know, same thing for alternative uh, tracks to becoming a teacher. I think that it's great that we can get a more diverse workforce, that we can get people who are changing careers and really allow them to transition easily and bring that experience and that foresight into the classroom. But when it's to the end of brainwashing them essentially into this new status quo, no, I'm not for that. It's because 
of money and power. So Allison, again, in in very clear and succinct terms, goes on to explain that. People who have a vested interest in seeing this happen are like the most powerful people in the world right now. <laughs> um, this is from uh, a talk from Vincent Mosco about cloud-based and big data. And you know, there, there's a designation from August 2016 of the, you know, the largest firms in the world. Um, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook are all invested and have a, have a financial direct vested interest in having digital learning, having this type of learning happen. Right? This is all about money and power and control, and they're doing it under the veil of access and equity. They are using our language and they are hijacking it for their profits. And right, this doesn't mean all technology is bad or that these initiatives are bad, but we really need to question whose interests are being served. And, and Allison, again, put this into really clear terms. So if we think it can't happen, it be, that these are just some crackpot people, these are not just crackpot people. There are really great forces that are pushing this. Right, and we're seeing them right now, right before our eyes. Um, so these are the various interest groups. I mean, there are others, again, behind personalized pathways. And I'm gonna be speaking about the Department of Defense origins, the tech industry, the research inst universities are all behind this. Uh, telecommunications, uh, Comcast is one of the major industries in Philadelphia. They're building a second huge skyscraper, the tallest building in the city, and it for technology. Um, but I think as we look at how technology happens in our classrooms, we need to think about the power behind the technology and whose interests are represented. So thinking about who, who is creating the, like, you know, who has created them, whose interests are they serving, like a playlist education? Um, are these free tools is this something that's just going to continue to allow small numbers of people to maintain power? And, and are, are they giving us freedom or subjugation? I mean, and I think those are the things, I mean, I have very strong feelings about where. Mm. And so do I, I have some very strong feelings about that too. Are they giving us freedom or are they giving us subjugation? And she goes on to play just this, very dystopian video that really puts all these different pieces in place that she's talking about. It was produced by one of these companies who's trying to give you an idea of what their ecosystem will be like in the future. And so I highly suggest going to check that out. I'll put the link down below, including the link with the timestamp to the part in the video where this video that she plays picks up and then the other half of her conversation that I don't break down here but really she just builds on this first half and she gets into some of these these more specifics about different companies and what they're doing and what these systems will look like and so before I leave you I just want to remind you again of that quote from Richard Carranza that he gave at one of his last press conferences before he left Right? He said, the new normal that we're talking about post-pandemic has really created some opportunities for us to individualize instruction and really tailor instruction for students in the way that we just didn't have the ability to do before the pandemic. So again, it sounds nice, but now knowing all that we know about this larger plan and where it's headed, this is exactly the reason. His departure is exactly the reason that we need to start not just to fight to open our schools, but specifically against these forces for uh, against too much technology in the classroom, against these hybrid models, against virtual learning as a commonplace thing. These are our children. And frankly, to put it in the terms that Michael put it into his article on Teachers for Choice, this is our world too. We should be selfish about that. Right? Technology is great, but it should be used to enhance our humanity, not minimize it. Data is good, but not when it's used to track and control us. Our children should be in classrooms with other children and with a real teacher in front of them. They deserve their humanity to be recognized and to be cultivated in an authentic way, not through virtual reality or through an algorithm, but in the real world world and that's the world I want to live in too as a teacher 
doing what I love. So let me know in those comments down below. What do you think? Where do you see this headed? Am I overreacting? Or are you starting to read the tea leaves the way that I am? The way that Michael and New York Teachers for Choice is? The way that Allison is and the thousands of parents that are in her Facebook group. The way that a lot of New York City parents are starting to see it. A lot of progressives and liberals. So this and and that's what's very interesting about this issue is that it's not it's been made to be political. But when you look at the coalition of people who've come together to open the schools and fight back against this, it is nonpartisan. There's people from all different uh, political backgrounds, demographics, areas of the country. And so while on the one hand, I am very concerned, I'm also optimistic that the people have a real shot here of pushing back against these malevolent and very large, powerful forces. And so with that, I will leave you. Make sure you hit that like button if you like what you get here. We're definitely going to be doing more videos like this where we're really getting and digging deep into these issues, following the money, breaking it down, and um, hit that subscribe button, right? Like, subscribe, share. People need to hear this information because this ain't something that you're going to hear on regular channels. This ain't something you're going to hear most teachers talking about. It needs to be an everyday discussion between teachers about where all this, you know, virtual remote stuff is headed, right? So I know this was a heavy episode. Uh, so stay foolish out there, y'all. <laughs>